welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind partners. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp4u.com to start your 30-day free trial. And today, to be here with Kelly Purdue. And Kelly probably needs no introduction. If you need one, Kelly is a former military intelligence officer. He is a West Point graduate, and uh, he's been the winner of the Apprentice Reality TV show that was run and hosted by Donald Trump back in 2007. Six years, uh, Kelly has been working with an angel syndicate and has been an investor into a lot of companies in this company. Capital. What? Podcast Kelly, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, when I when I went through your LinkedIn profile, I I, I realized something that that really wipes um, enormously with this show. And um, this show is about risk. <clears throat> excuse me, is about risk takers. And um, we 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 share this common curiosity. In order to be a risk taker, <clears throat> in, it's not just you need to know something slightly different than everyone else out there. You also need to be curious. And what I've seen is that you, you really took this to an extreme. You were involved with 50 or more than 50 different companies as an investor, as a mentor, as an advisor, or as an operator. It seemed like running corporate America kind of kind of in a way that nobody, nobody has seen that yet. Is that true? Well, there are a lot of interesting pieces to what you just asked. Um, I think one is how people, you know, different people define risk differently. So when you talk about risk, that's one thing. But the, I think the underlying theme for what gets me excited and what I love about what I'm able to do every day is actually engaging with entrepreneurs. And if you think, you know, since kind of the beginning of the, this country's inception, like entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of the country. You know, good, good, bad, or indifferent, but it's the driving force. It's a massive differentiator. Um, and I did serve in the military with that kind of servant leadership DNA. And I think that, you know, my involvement in the entrepreneurial sector, both as an operator um, and as an angel investor, then a lead syndicate, and then a venture capitalist. I mean, some entrepreneurs would argue I went to the dark side, but I would argue that it's, it's it's a it's almost a natural evolution where you can have a greater and greater impact, right? I can run one company, and that's a, that can be a very significant impact as it grows. Um, as I've learned over time, I can then start advising and helping younger on you know newer entrepreneurs, and then I can help some entrepreneurs that need a, just a little bit of help with both money 
and with you know connectivity network and my experience and so it's been a I guess a broadening of my ability to impact things uh, but kudos to you for being able to make it through my very very long uh, LinkedIn profile but I, I, I would say that some would argue that um, that is indicative of the uh, jack of all trades and master of none <laughs> syndrome as well. Yeah, this, I get the same advice when I was younger. People would say, you know, that's generally good life advice, I guess, for most people. They will tell you, you have to find one thing that you really like. You got to specialize, you got to dig in, you got to create some value, you got to know everything there is about it. And then you create a business out of this, or you become an employee, you, you rise up within this organization. And uh, then you maybe can jump to something else by the time you're 50. And then you do one or two more things in your life, and that's basically it. For me, that never worked. And I feel like we, we, we are brothers in arms there. At 20, I think I was 27 years old. So I graduated from West Point, served time in the military, and then gone to law and business school, the joint JD MBA program at UCLA. And I had also read uh, Richard Kiyosaki's second book. Most people know uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but the second yeah. book is called Cash Flow Quadrant. And it, it's really fundamental, but if you, unless you think about it all the time, it doesn't, it may not make sense, but it, and it also kind of goes back to risk. But I, I was sitting at the printers, uh, which is kind of an old school notion. They still have them, but it's basically where right at the end of a very large transaction, like a large corporate deal, you know, both sides of the transaction show up and you plan to stay there for two or three days and you're literally at a printer where they're going through the contracts. So all the docu all the documentation and the attorneys are there, the accountants are there, some of the principals may or may not be there. And the third morning, the, the company was being purchased, it was an acquisition. I was there as, a, as an intern with a law firm, right? This is in late JD MBA program, I was in law school, so I was working the law firm. And we were representing the company that was getting acquired. Right, so these liquidity events that all the entrepreneurs talk about and how a lot of wealth is created and what's going on, whether it's an IPO or an acquisition. This was an acquisition. And we'd been you know, working for three days, you know, and the two big law firm attorneys, you know, at then it was only $600 an hour, but that was a lot back then, um, yeah. were arguing. And it was the early morning and the CEO and the CFO, both gentlemen from Texas, older cowboy boots, suits, smoking cigars at like 9 a.m. in the morning, you know, came in and the, 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 their attorney and then the other side's attorney was arguing about where a comma went, like and that comma and comma that. And the CFO leaned over to the CEO and goes, you believe we're paying these sons of bitches $600 an hour to argue about where a comma goes? And my, you know, proverbial light bulb above my head was like, I want to be the, the people that are as on, on one end of the transaction, not the attorneys or the vendors or the accountants that are working on it. And that was my impetus. To, you know, my risk was ending up kind of as a, in, in the worker mode, not in the ability to impact, grow and be creative and create, create significant wealth for the entire ecosystem. So that, that was kind of my, you know, not wanting to close off doors, even though I went through law school, went through business school, it's like that entrepreneurial route is what was attractive to me and pulled me in because I didn't consider it to be risk. I considered risk to be working for the man, uh, you know, somebody being able to call and ask, where are you right now? What are you doing? And then, you know, that's a little bit of an illusion that you have any of that freedom as an entrepreneur, <laughs> but you still, every, everyone is your boss when you're an entrepreneur, but that was the, that was the driving force. They just, just not called boss, right? That's right. the, that's generally the difference. Um, no, I, 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 I hear you, and this I think is 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 and I, this is kind of my message also to younger entrepreneurs, and it's this you you it's it's sometimes hard to to see that you are a part of that calling because the general life advice and I think that works for a big, bigger part of the population is correct that you need that specialization, but the. the your gene and then I'm, I'm sure sooner or later um, they're going to find out what that actually is or what character traits it is made of. But there isn't much. You won't be happy in a big organization. As you say, the risk is, is completely different um, in your mind. And, and so it was in my mind. I also went to, through law school, but I realized I never want to work as a lawyer. That's just not what I want to do because it doesn't create any value. Obviously, it creates value, but it doesn't create. That's why I find this in interesting. You, talk, you use that lawyer example. 
it's not the value I want to create and how I want to be in society and contribute something. Um, so that's that. You've been going, um, you know, I, when, when I saw this, um, I, I realized you're kind of the social media star. Before social media even was around, you were on The Apprentice. And at the time, I think it was a major reality TV show, right? Yeah, for uh, season two, our finale had 30 million viewers. So half a Super, half a Super Bowl, half an NFL yeah. Super Bowl. Um, and you did your own TV show, right? So uh, it, during the year where I worked with Donald Trump in New York City, uh, I also hosted a show on the military channel called GI Factory, where it looked at uh, where it was kind of like a dirty jobs, but for military weapons, vehicles, and equipment. And I was very um, uh, purposeful about where I worked and what I did in the aftermath of winning of winning that show and having that much exposure and I went with kind of the two the two themes that were central to kind of who I am one was kind of entrepreneurship and business and the other was things having to do or related to the military um, both in yeah. publishing my book and hosting that that show uh, and then a lot of the uh, charities and activities that I was associated with after after the show were were focused on those. I had a lot of opportunities to do other stuff, like be a judge at the Miss Hawaiian Tropic contest that I did not do. <laughs> but there were there were a lot of those that maybe sometimes you look back and go, maybe I should have done those. But I, anyway, I I stuck to my uh, to my guiding kind of principles, if you will. Well, thank you. Back, there were opportunities. A lot of people say that when they look back in their life and they're older, the the, the thing they feel worse worse about is the things that most yeah. Hey, but do you do you already have some certain regrets, or feel like, well, I did so many things, and obviously, you know, you you the only regret you probably have is that you did too many things. Yeah, I, I would I would say that I am not one of those you know, looking back and feeling badly about regrets. I'm much more of a forward looking, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I think I'm much more forward looking in what's going on. So I don't, I also have tried to be very grounded and aware of what's going on at the time and kind of realize that now is the only thing that matters and like absorb and do as much as possible. So I got to do way more than a normal person or maybe normal three or four or five people's lifetimes um, as part of that show. And then also through what I did with West Point and the military. And, you know, I, there, there are so many things that I am incredibly fortunate to have, you know, kind of combination worked hard and fortunate and started in a great spot in life and was able to do and am still capable of doing that. I, I don't spend much time at all on, on, on regrets for things that I didn't do or missed. Yeah. Already, um, you, you're, your your is inspired by what was being conceived generally as as military values, and I had uh, uh, Mike Saray on the on the podcast uh, a couple of days ago, and we talked about that, and he mentioned, you know, there is this big change in what happened to how society thinks of military values, and the one way. It, it expresses itself is that a lot of veterans that came out of World War II, they actually became entrepreneurs, maybe 50%, 60%, really big numbers. But if you look at um, most military members now, they weirdly enough only have a very small percentage um, that go the entrepreneur. So interestingly, so our, our VC fund is called Moonshots Capital, and my partner uh, is also a West Point graduate. And we invested together, you know, both serial entrepreneurs, we both invested together as, I'll call it old school angels, you know, pre-angel list, and, or, you know, crowdfunding or the ability to meet everybody very fast and very quickly. So you'd be in your community and, you know, you know the dozen or maybe two dozen people who frequently write angel checks, right? So if you find an entrepreneur that you like, you're gonna like, okay, I, lo I love it, I'm gonna write a check, I'm in. And now now because I'm an angel and I invest, it's my job to find the other angels for you. So I now find 
I make my phone call or send my email to eight or 10 others and say, just, hey, I've done due diligence. I like this entrepreneur, send me your check. And so sight unseen, you know, a few more 25. You get 10 of those checks, you got a quarter of a million bucks. The entrepreneur, friend and family, 20, 250. You got a half a million bucks to try to get an MVP. Guess what? Now I'm rolling up my sleeves as the angel. Now I'm helping the entrepreneur. Oh, we got a bridge because we didn't quite make it far enough on that first chunk of capital. So, 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 so I, I now help you do, do a little bit more. Craig and I were doing that together, right? He was in DC and Austin. I was in LA and we were, we would be in each other's calls. When we, when we decided to start leading syndicates, thanks to Naval and angel list, having the new action letter from the sec saying as a lead angel, you could get carry. Um, we looked, you know, at about three years of syndicate deals and we've done, I don't know, 39 or 40 of them now. And we said, okay, we, we also want to have committed capital that we can put to work immediately, that we can invest with conviction and, you know, where we can take a board seat, we can actually lead the deal, right? So that was just hard to do as a syndicate because you don't know when it's, how much you're going to end up with or when it's going to come in. So we had to become even more disciplined on our thesis for how and why we were investing. So what we did is we did a regression analysis against all, at the time, 75 investments we'd made and said, what factor that we can control for at the time of investment is most relevant to high ROI, right? In terms of a good outcome. Yeah. And the one factor we could control for was the quality of the leadership team. Yeah. The only place in the world that we're aware of where millions of dollars is spent training people in leadership per se is in the military. And then there are a whole bunch of network effects that occur post putting the money in, in there. But we like deals and we look closer at deals where there's a military veteran on the founding team. So we've spent now 10 plus years watching early stage tech, you know, technology ecosystem and connecting with networking, marketing, describing the value proposition of having a military veteran as you know, a former Navy SEAL, a jet pilot, a, you, you name it, right? Wherever they happen to have come from, but they've been steeped in actual leadership training. And what you described at the beginning of the question, and this is my long way to get, get around to it of, you know, yeah, World War II saw a significant number of individuals come out and become entrepreneurs. What has happened since then? And there's specific data and indicators showing that it, dro it, it decreased significantly, but it has started to come back significantly. And that's due to a whole bunch of things. One is the awareness that you could become an entrepreneur has become much more pervasive. The tools that allow you to become an entrepreneur are also easier to access for everyone. And there are actual organizations. I happen to be on the board of one of them called Bunker Labs that is all about helping military veterans and military veteran spouses pursue entrepreneurship. And there are 40 plus chapters across the United States with a full ecosystem that it helps enable, you know, much like a tech stars, much like a, but it's, it's called Bunker Labs. And so there are many organizations like that that, is, that have enabled that to occur. But we are still seeing, you know, of our 100 to 150 deals a month that we have inbound at the VC fund, six to 10% of them have military veterans associated with them. So we're still in the, you know, non-trivial numbers of entrepreneurs who have military backgrounds, understanding that that's an opportunity for them and a, and a way to, to come execute. When military inspired deals, and I think we can all agree that the leadership is, is general feel like they would, would be lacking up or they are less versed with marketing. You know, what's like the downside or is there no downside? It's just the same. Yeah. And, and that, that's a fair question. I think that, um, the, all of the dynamics that ensue for any startup, limited resources, unclear battlefield, uh, enemies coming in from every direction, having to convince people to do something that it seems impossible and or doesn't fully exist yet and is only in somebody's mind. Maybe you can map some of it out or plan it and try to show what it is. Uh, maintaining your integrity with all of the stakeholders. I mean, 
you just described what it's like on a actually on a battlefield, right? So when you take away actual bullets flying, who, who is able to handle that pressure, uncertainty, understanding that you still need to accomplish the mission? You know, I, I would argue that there's not no better training ground other than having gone through being an entrepreneur before, which is also yeah. high on our which is high on our list of we love we love second and third time entrepreneurs as part as, for for investing also. But um, do uh, the leadership traits that exist in the military apply themselves into more functional capabilities? Sometimes um, cyber deals, not you know, non-trivial operations and logistics components, non-trivial. Um, but I, I would offer that um, in almost all instances, it's not just the. It's never the creativity that makes the venture successful, it's the execution. Like you have to go execute. So it may not, it may not be that the, um, the driving vision or the eureka moment that occurred in an industry that caused this entrepreneur to say this, but the co-founding chief operating officer or the co-founding pre or, or the, the COO, if you will, what, I mean, what, whatever it might be, um, certainly, those roles are obvious, perfect slots. Um, but we've had a lot of a lot of phenomenal experience with the the creativity and the problem solving and the attack. And just everything that you want from a leader that you would want from your entrepreneur has already been trained in the military. It's 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 really uh, interesting that we we probably had a, a similar leadership training and similar values embedded in lots of different institutions and society, but on focusing on them. And the military had that too, but it's now it seems like it has a monopoly on creating these leadership and mentoring initiatives for most young people between the ages of nine. Doesn't do it anymore. The family doesn't do it anymore. Definitely not your high school. They all just say, do whatever you want. It's all good. There's no right way. There's only your way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, um, you know, you, you hear uh, tossed about and brought up periodically this thought process of some type of, you know, universal obligation for two or three years of post high school, you know, effort, whether that's Peace Corps or a civil civil corps inside in, inside of the country or the military where you actually get to learn how to do things how to work with other people how to lead how to follow which is just as important that you know, the military trains and, and how to lead right it's like you know one one of the big issues especially for entrepreneurs and startups is you can foster and develop this idea of we're going to collaborate you know Everybody's got you know a great insight, view, opinion from what we're doing. At some point in time, a decision has to be made to go execute, and that's when, okay, we had great collaboration. It's now time to everybody stop arguing, and everybody pull 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 the same direction. And the companies that are able to execute with that and understand still and be and be true to the authentic collaboration, where everyone involved is listening and understanding the feedback, and then the direction set. The problems arise when everybody still feels like, oh, their voice at the table, and they don't get that there's a point in time where you're done talking about it, and you now have to go execute because a competitor is going to be executing. And you know that that I think is something that's huge. And I, and I and I do agree with you that um, the military does a very very good job of describing that leadership and training in that leadership component for your role for your spot why it's important for you to execute when no one's watching. All, all of those are incredibly important uh, lessons that are taught. It's not exclusive to the military, interestingly. It's just everyone in the military got that. So it's a great pool from which to choose from. I think that you get you know, te team sports, especially through highly competitive environments, has much of the same, m many of the same leadership characteristics. You're, you're a part of a team. It's this, this is important for why it's important for you to do what you're doing. In some case, in some scenarios, you're leading. In some scenarios, you're following. The discipline of showing up every day, the fact that other people are depending on like there's a lot of great elements or components to that. Um, and and then also, you know, 
there's nothing like trial by fire. So if you've been through the, the meat grinder of entrepreneurship, it helps you the second time, most certainly. For sure. I'm posting basically on my 12th startup now, and uh, you, you, you've learned a lot, but also a lot of, um, you know, once they, they call this a macro investing, they say, if, they're, if, if you do business as usual, you want like a 50 year old who's been through the ups and downs of seen it all. But once the paradigm shifts and in, in macro investing, that's, you know, the dollar suddenly goes on a long term trend to go up. You want a 20 year old that just has a Robin Hood account and basically um, just, you know, play her ups and the most risky thing and cannot even imagine there's an ups and downs. So I feel like maybe entrepreneurship is now the, the old entrepreneurship, the way I understand it, we understand it. Maybe it's morphing into something new. I don't know what it is yet, and I don't know how applicable the, the old rules are, but I feel like it's morphed already. And one that I found interesting when, when we talked about that earlier, about the TV show, most Silicon Valley, there's a big divide between Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and LA, and LA in terms of Hollywood. So there's very little overlap on the creative side. A lot of those um, avenues that LA provides in terms of reaching your audience, creating content that's so engaging, it's good for a wider audience. That's rarely something that most entrepreneurs think of in Silicon Valley. And I find this, I find this odd because a lot of the advertising spend, or the biggest amount of tech advertising spent is now all online. So there is YouTube and there's, there's certain avenues, but there's very little overlap and you did it differently, right? I feel like you, you are an entrepreneur and you, you explored the content route very early on, 15 years ago. What do you think is the future of this? Will they merge together Silicon Valley and LA more and Hollywood or will they stay separate as they are right now? So I think that the, the ecosystem of Los Angeles has been fighting kind of tooth and nail the you know, you know, we, we, we have phenomenal entrepreneurs, we have phenomenal companies, and the, the track record's great. I mean, everything, you know, Cornerstone on Demand, True Car, there's, there's, there, there are lists of what are considered to be real technology companies by Silicon Valley, right? They, they exist, they've succeeded, they've become billion dollar publicly traded companies, you know, from inception all the way through. The fact that this is the heart of kind of content creation, um, and that, that that mindset and being able to understand how that can evolve into business models is incredibly compelling, especially with what's occurred over the last five-ish years with everything from, you know, fake news to influencers to it, it's, it's, it's actually incredibly powerful to be able to understand and think about that. And it's one of the, you know, the tie-in from, you say that, you know, I took advantage of or was able to uh, learn from, you know, what happened with me with The Apprentice. Well, I, I sat, you know, next to Donald Trump and watched him operate in 2004 around yeah. driving The Apprentice numbers, meaning his, you know, outreaches to everybody from Martha Stewart to Rosie O'Donnell that seemed to be out of the blue attacks we're literally two to three weeks before the next season of The Apprentice would begin. So it was all like this, cal you know, it was a calculated ma mastering of, of media, you know, of, of being able to utilize media to affect an outcome, which we replicated again four years ago in the lead, in the lead, up, in, in the lead up to the election. And I think that uh, the companies and the entrepreneurs who are able to think about what the marketing looks like so that it can be effective for whatever they're doing win they just they win yeah. with a, even with a even with a worse product because if you're in front of the consumer whether that can whether that whether your audience is business or consumer side if you know of course the product has to work and meet a certain bar but if you're adept and you do things very effectively with your marketing it it pretty much beats all the other functions. Yeah, hard to figure that out. And it, I think Sam Harris was the one on his podcast. He did some research, um, and um, they realized that uh, Donald Trump had about a hundred times the coverage that Obama had 
during his presidency, and as the same is probably true before the election 2016, all the way up to 2020. Now it's being uh, it's apt a little, um, and this is. You think of him politically. I think this is just a genius. I think that that most of us will never rise to. Um, I, I feel like for there's still a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to play that content game well and, and think slightly outside YouTube. Everyone thinks of YouTube, right? But nobody thinks of the bigger channels. Nobody thinks of what, what's what's beyond there. And uh, watching um, documentary um, about uh, Chris Nolan's movies, and I felt he could as easily be, um, you know, an old school CEO of of Silicon Valley. He isn't politically correct. These people all exactly know their trade. They seem to know exactly what they're up to. So I felt like there is a lot of overlap between those two cultures, but somehow they haven't really clicked. And maybe that's just happening in the next five years. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, with the pandemic, uh, with kind of the work from anywhere mentality, uh, with the, you know, what's happened in and around San Francisco ecosystem and the flight of significant companies, I mean, Oracle, moving to Austin is staggering. It's like the old school bastion, you know, the best place to learn how to do enterprise sales in the world. You know, we're leaving, you know, to, to uh, Joe Lonsdale from 8VC saying, we're leaving for all different, you know, for multitude of reasons, right? It wasn't just one thing. Um, it's, it's definitely, there's been a massive influx of, Nor Northern California venture capitalists, entrepreneurs into the Los Angeles ecosystem over the last two to four years, more, you know, more so recently. And I think that that, you know, cross pollination will certainly, you know, accelerate the time frame for those two, the, the, those two kind of ways of approaching business coming together. Yeah, I guess. Very soon, right? You broke so, up there. Everyone's going to be in Austin very soon. Yeah, I, I don't um, just buy land in Austin. You don't even have to go there. Just buy. Just, just <laughs> it's probably going up. <laughs> it's so cheap, also. It's so cheap. Um, I, I don't understand Austin. I mean, I love it, but I don't understand yeah. the place. Um, it, which is, you know, I, I'm I'm not a happy resident in San Francisco. You you're still in LA, right? You're still holding up the. Park. I I am still here in Los Angeles. My uh, one one of my twins is a real is a really good soccer player, and the ecosystem for youth soccer and in, in the United States anyway, it's pretty hard to beat Southern California's uh, training and professionals and the ecosystem for that. So, and the beach and the what weather. Would be your, what would be your catalyst when you say, okay, that's it, I'm going? When uh, PSG or Barcelona asks him into the academy. <laughs> that's happening next year? <laughs> He, he turns 11 in three days, so it might, it might be it might be another year or two. Yeah, you might have to wait a little longer. Okay. <laughs> how do how do I um, sag from this one? Um, <laughs> talking about big ideas. Uh, so one thing that I've been trying to to get um, some traction on is Peter Thiel's theory, and and Eric. I've, I've been 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 hyping this up, you could say. But the idea is this big stagnation out there outside of semiconductor and uh, the finance field we haven't done much of what we set out to do in the 70s and it's been 50 years and you know i'm i'm a child of the of the late 90s i'm an, i'm born um, my professional life started with this euphoria for sure but there was a lot of things to be accomplished even though some of the companies went away a lot of things that um we're now seeing the fruits of so i I was, my first question is, do you believe in this idea of the great stagnation? Is it as apparent to you? And second, do you think, what can we do to change this or is it already changing right now? Um, I, I don't feel strongly either way on trying to define it as stagnation. I'm, I am of the firm belief as evidenced by the speed at which we were able to, we, the collective we, like the not not the royal we, but everyone, uh, kind of got on the same page to target a common enemy called you know COVID nineteen for for a vaccine and production. And even though I'm, I think I'm two hundred and sixty eight millionth on the list that the New York Times put for where, where you are in the line for getting a vaccine, getting a vaccine based on your zip code, your age, and every health and everything else. Um, you know, I I do believe that we are 
behind on solving some obvious and primary issues that exist. Uh, and that we do have the ability, I'd say we're behind because if we turned our attention to them the same way we turned our attention to solving for the vaccine problem, uh, we would accelerate a lot of them. I think one, one of them that is kicking into gear uh, as evidenced by, at least on the venture side, you know, a lot of public statements of people moving into focusing on what we're gonna do about protecting the climate and doing stuff to affect the climate is pretty significant. And then um, another one that I think we're going to see to part of, part of, part of your second question is we're, we're shifting gears and moving, there'll be some faster movement in a lot of these. I think that um, the kind of aug the, the, the augmented reality being able to impact everyone's lives is, is going to accelerate also. The prom that you know the promise that the consumer would would be able to have augmented reality in a dynamic environment outside of a closed in room I think is a lot closer than I think I think everybody got their hopes up on Magic Leap for a while and that didn't pan out and I think that there are a bunch of up and coming solutions that are going to be able to help solve for some of that that allow for a whole lot of neat things to happen. Yeah, I mean, pieces is that technology has been ready. You know, think about video conferen conferencing has been ready for twenty years. But it hasn't been gotten widely accepted. There's been certain, there's been some programs. Helps right now. So uh, I think what what has and that's surprising because at the end, as it was very apparent, I grew up in in Germany, that the U.S. is a consumer market who is ready to uh, and try stuff out out of curiosity, but also because it helps you get ahead because you might be double as efficient as your competitor. So on the professional and on the personal side, I feel there was always a certain curiosity. So methodology went relatively quick compared to say Europe. Because it seems like a lot of that technology that was developed 20 years ago, it, it happened, the adoption happened, but when we look back the last 15 years, it seems extremely slow and it only was only like the largest um, platforms, Apple, Amazon, were able to get through with this. And that would have predicted um, 15 years ago. But if you feel like we've lost a little bit that speed on the consumer side, or it was the fault of the entrepreneurs not creating products that are appealing enough or cheap enough um, for, for consumers. It's interesting you brought up video conferencing because I think it was about 20 years ago and my first learning experience as an entrepreneur, i.e. failed company, was a video conferencing company. Um, and it was the, you know, it was, it was the competitors publicly traded were like VTEL, Compression Labs, I think Tanberg was coming on, and they were, we, we, we affectionately referred to the, tele, the video conferencing system as a boat anchor, because it was like this giant thing that sat in the corner, had 27 ISDN lines plugged into it, and you needed an operator to come turn it on and do stuff with it. And we were raising money because we'd solve for it. And I think it was Microsoft and Intel came out with the see you, see me little ball that sits on the front of your camera for like 900 bucks a seat. And we were, we were like $300,000. <laughs> so, um, yes, there are some, there are some technologies that you would think would have been adopted and move much, much faster. Video conferencing certainly being one of them. Um, obviously that's accelerated with what's transpired, but, I don't know who to, I don't know, it's difficult to say who to blame because you, you usually need like a killer app to make something explode and you know for, for video conferencing and for a lot of other things associated with remote learning and distance learning, you know, the pandemic certain certainly the killer app for that, that unfortunately literally and figuratively. Um, yeah. But you know, who's to say and part, part of the identification in, in what I try to do every day meeting entrepreneurs is think about what are the potential problems that this solves for, both right now and then how hard, it is, how hard is it to get to scale where that becomes a very large opportunity, right? Both for, for all the stakeholders, right? For the, for the, for the end users of the product, all, you know, up to and including also, you know, the employees, the build, the partners, the, the shareholders, the ecosystem, you name it. And 
it, it is a significant part of the thought process we go through when we're looking at making final decisions on who we're going to invest in. Right, you can only make certain predictions and don't be a, be a, be a rock. And you got to get lucky. Yeah. So, wait, wait. I mean, you, you talk about, we only talk to the winners, like right? the people who lost a billion dollars, they don't get invited to the podcast. They're like, no. uh, they, they, I, they're depressed at home. Or they, no, maybe I, they became Marks, the philosophers. I, I, I say uh, with all humility, and I think that our entrepreneurs would back it up, that I think we're, we're, Craig and I are pretty good at picking the companies, and then we do our best to help help after the fact. And because we've been entrepreneuring for so long and have significant networks in certain sectors and have seen this movie before as it relates to execution, like we talked about before, we're able to help you know, increase the likelihood of success of the ones we put the money into so it looks like we had, we looks like maybe we were geniuses in how we invested. And it's really like a whole bunch of hard work after we put the money in to try to make that, to make that, to make it look like we were right. <laughs> Your, your 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 best investment, the one that you you always want to talk about. You haven't mentioned any yet. Um, so it's what what who's your favorite child? Which which of your children is your favorite? No, so uh, I think for impact right now, um, also in terms of imp impressiveness of the entrepreneur, I would say ID me, ID dot is 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 a uh, is a favorite investment of mine. Blake Hall, also a former military veteran. Uh, is solving online identity verification issues. And if you've seen the massive amount of fraud across the states for people trying to get their very, very critical unemployment checks to the point where states had to shut down because the fraud was so bad, ID.me has systematically turned all of those, every state they turn on with shuts off the fraud and allows for people to get their checks out. But they're doing really amazing things, protecting your personal individual identity and allowing you to be both ubiquitous, a la Facebook login, and secure. Like the only place you can log in your Wells Fargo three-factor, you know, where'd your mother grow up? And somebody calls you on like, they, they can do both that level of security and be ubiquitous. Um, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty, pretty phenomenal company. And if you think about the identity layer of the internet, you know, it, it becomes, it's going to become payments. It's going to become travel. It become, it's everything. We need, we need a crypto for identity because the internet was built weirdly enough. For, um, I think this is because they were researchers, right? Because they wanted anonymous traffic to an extent, but they, they also felt like this is not never going to be an issue. There's not going to be any bots. Those are all intellectuals in a, monetary transactions were never covered, right? And we, we waited 10 years from the 2000s to get, you know, we have people that because it wasn't global we had crypto but for the identity layer that there hasn't been someone who was able to establish such a layer um, and I, y yes there is it's ID me um, and majorly flying under the radar purposefully um, but with this last six months of stopping the fraud um, now has bad guys attention so there they're, they're, you know we 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 just hired the full time CISO, so we know we we we've seen what's coming and we know what's coming. But I'm very I'm very excited about that company. Another one, um, it's it's a, it's a second time entrepreneur for us, is called Gretel. And think GitHub for data, so they're able to create synthetic data that allows developers to work with data sets, synthetic data sets, but that it does even better than being the data that for compliance reasons, for red tape, for you know, you know, personal information or personal health information reasons is not uh, shareable. They enable that data to be uh, the, the, the synthetic better than the equivalent of that data because they can fill out, they can fill out the missing pieces of the data set with the synthetic component. And it's actually more valuable to be, 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 to be used. Um, it's for, you know, second and third time entrepreneurs that came together for this. Uh, Alex Watson's the founder and the CEO. He sold his last company that he started to Amazon into and 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 launched the product in AWS to much success. Um, and they are they are doing some really amazing things um, by enabling anybody who needs to or wants to for whatever reason to work with data. 
an example, uh, over 60 year old data set for heart disease. Um, they were able to open it up, open up the data set by creating it in synthetic layers. So there's no way to get to the identifiable components. Um, populated some of the sectors that were missing of yeah. the data for like the, uh, I think it was females over 65 because there wasn't a lot of samples. And they increased the correct diagnosis capability by like 7%. So that's gonna impact major, major population. This is not mock up data, this is real data that they source from somewhere else and then they, 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 they modify and they provide it to, to a third party client. Correct, they can come into a private company or the government or whoever else Anal analyze it and create a synthetic data set that better than mirrors the original data set because it fills it out appropriately and then then you then your developers and your you know an analyst can knock yourself out with it without worrying about compliance and make decisions and understand what's going on it's pretty it's really powerful weeks ago to to my canal scene and he mentioned the biggest challenges in life sciences is really to get the data set up and, and run his favorite AI um, program. At, you know, like, stuck with really shitty data set. Yeah, uh, if you can even if you even, if you even get the data set, if you can get to it, and then it's not it's not smooth. You have to do a whole bunch of work on it before you start trying to work with it. Of those images, like cancer images, that's already a huge amount. Of data. Doesn't, stock data um, um, from, from Yahoo for free. You know, the data sets that you have in many other industries to that industry, but in life sciences it hasn't. And this is what it could make the biggest impact, right? Because if you get this right, it much better. Yeah, they, they have, when they published that finding, the inbound from the health, science, health and life sciences was astronomical for people wanting to say, hey, you know, of course, they need to show that it's secure, that they, there's no way to reverse manipulate the synthetic component to get to the PII or the PHI, all, all of those dynamics. But this is a this is a phenomenal yeah. team. Um, uh, Gray, Greylock, Greylock followed us in and, and led the A round awesome. last month. Yeah. Well, see right now, what do you feel? What is like your gut feeling? Um, those deals have changed. They've gotten better. The better valuations, worse valuations. If, more necessity entrepreneurs or more the, the this is more well thought through because people have more time. Well, what do you feel right now from the current deal flow in the last couple of months? So our deal flow, um, it definitely slowed down March, April. Everybody was on both sides. I think most VCs were also, you know, triaging their existing portfolios and saying, okay, what does this mean for us at this last a long time? And entrepreneurs also were like, Mm, I don't think anybody's paying attention to us or trying to put money in. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. So let's look in. So it slowed down both directions. Um, yeah. It has since kicked back up. Absolutely. Um, I, I like what, the, the terminology you just used from necessity, but we're, we're like, uh, we, we definitely emphasize and focus on must haves or need to haves, not nice to haves. Right, because those things fall by the way. First things, they're they're always second priority, and they always fall by the wayside. And if there's if there's anything else going on, um, our our deal flow that we've been looking at, I would describe it as the companies that we're seeing and we're looking at closer. And it's probably a combination, but they're I want to say farther along, farther along in revenue, farther along in product build out. Um, more thoughtful in exactly what the unit economics are going to be if they're if they're a little bit earlier on how on how it's going to operate, um, and much less. Um, hey, here's a great idea. Here's what we're thinking about. I've got a team cobbled together. That's just we we, we just those seem to drop like the noise significantly dissipated in terms of value. Um, I have always believed that the best deals are always competitive and they get priced to market and anything in and around San Francisco or you know up north is is more expensive it could be identical team identical everything it's just more expensive than outside of outside of that area 
Um, but I, I, I'd say that there's been, there's, there was definitely a deflation and I think it's about back to where it was before the pandemic. Yeah. Because of house prices, I feel they, they, the cost of living have all been, been, has been baked into that and in in, uh, basically are back to where they were 10 years ago, which is a great sign of that. Exactly cheap, but it's definitely more normal. With that area, so yeah. Since you're an expert, what I want your opinion on is crowdfunding and the way that crowdfunding has opened up now. To and I talked to, to Darren um, a couple of days ago. What's coming? That's already being in the law. It's not published yet, but it's going to change a lot. That's you know very solid Series B, a Series C impact on the venture capital and angel business would it make it better or easier so so 100 percent agree that crowdfunding and the ability to access capital is getting easier every year and i think that that helps the initial rounds of financing i i think that crowdfunding lends itself to consumer facing products and services much more so than it does to enterprise solutions and or longer term solutions. So for kind of consumer market elements, it means there, there'll be more ideas funded farther so that they'll have an opportunity to pivot and or get traction so that they can get institutional institutional backing. But I, we just experienced, uh, you know, a, a crowdfunded deal called Heroic, who, uh, you know, for years, I think he'd raised 10 million, serial entrepreneur, very successful, sold it, but he'd only raised $10 million over the years for two, two prior companies. And in launching this, you know, crowdfunding element, texting me after six hours, after 12 hours, after three days, where it went 1 million, 3.5 million, 10 million, <laughs> and it's pretty staggering. Frank mentioned, when you think of it, if you have a way to get your message in front of um, a consumer, and because they're not as discriminate, because they don't have the expert knowledge, if say in a thousand or two in a thousand, the, the exact numbers obviously differ slightly, but if you have an audience that's captive because you're an influencer, you're, you, you have an outreach to people, that you that you're going to fill this round. This is this isn't. It's it's not his experience that, that the investors discriminate so much. So he he convert there as as a consumer to how much money you raise. It's pretty linear. Yeah, I think that I think that the um, there's most definitely an opportunity to do that. What what will likely transpire is there's going to be lightning in a bottle, there's going to be great things that occur and some of those, they're going to, like I said, evolve, they get enough money to figure something out, pivot and get excitement level somewhere else. So there are going to be success stories, right? Like you said, we cover the success stories, we don't cover the failures, but we're going to have a whole lot of data against these crowdsourced entities where 90 plus percent of them probably aren't going to, you know, probably like by the, by the numbers of, you know, just starting a business, running a business, 90 plus percent of them aren't going to work out. So there'll be an initial excitement level where a lot of money flows in and a lot of money, like you said, if you have a significant number of influence, but I'm only getting five bucks from every person or 10 bucks or a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever, whatever the num number is allowed to be. I, I consider it, if I'm the consumer, it's my, it's kind of like, instead of buying lottery tickets, I'm buying, I'm buying into the, into that system where I can actually experience something with it. Instead of just a, the balls pop up for the lottery, I am now, I can buy that coffee drink or I can get the, you know, new glasses holder or whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. I just, I think, I still think though that for instance, Gretel that I just described where, where it's, you know, some AI and some machine learning around doing statistical analysis and creating synthetic data sets, they would probably raise $1 on crowdfunding because <laughs> people would be like, what the heck is that? Here's the thing. I mean, consumer innovation, we, we all think of it, and, and, and I, I think that's kind of normal for, for, for VCs unless you have a huge following. They kind of look down on them and say, well, you know, there's nothing behind it. Can easily be copied. I have 30,000 VP level and above LinkedIn. 
if I if I were if I were legally allowed to do fundraising through a through a mechanism, I would I would do it. <laughs> I would get more than one. I would get more than one dollar. I don't. I gotta talk to LinkedIn about Microsoft about switching over the uh, thought process around. Let's let's turn it into a fundraising platform. Happen? They're gonna have an add-on like they have recruiting. They're gonna have fundraising. One hundred percent. It's gonna happen very soon. Yeah, probably next to, month. Has to do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. They're gonna do this, and this is where we're, we're certainly that the money comes from. This is where I test my startups. So I don't LinkedIn. I think they all do this. We, Most we, valuable we, tool I've had, maybe either Excel or LinkedIn. I don't know which one's more powerful. Yeah, for me, isn't it? Over 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 the course of time, Excel's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And I can't really say because LinkedIn really went through. Um, a really bad period, and um, I worked with one of the founders. Um, and I, you worked probably with Reed Hoffman. I worked with Constantine for for a couple of weeks, and uh, Constantine Garica. And at the time, LinkedIn wasn't growing very quickly. It it never made any money, and uh, then it really took off um, for a while. And then it kind of seemed to go the way of Google Plus. But now I feel the last two years, it's like it's like back. Um, I don't know what drives these things. You know, social networks. I have no idea how it actually works. There's some that just take off, and others just die out within a matter of month. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight there. Well, you you bring so interestingly when uh, when my finale of The Apprentice was on, Burnett had structured a relationship with Yahoo, like to talk about the show and the content and the excerpts and all that stuff, and then they did a deal with Friendster. Do you remember Friendster? Yes, of course. I'm that old. Can you imagine? Well, I, I had about like, I don't know, fifty thousand Filipino followers on Friendster because they put you know our things up, and I, I did I I never figured out a way that that was any way for that to create value for what I was doing. I was probably a bad entrepreneur and couldn't figure out a way to utilize that asset. But it, yeah. and then, like you I said, though, that. Friendster kind of fade. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't I'm, I think it's dead. I don't even know, but like it, it, I haven't heard of it or seen it in a decade plus. So, you know, if 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 any if you know anyone who can describe exactly what the magical elements are for making a social media platform <laughs> work, I know I know there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time studying it, and I I haven't gotten to the bottom of it, but I have well, been. me away. Yeah, but I I have been a you know since two thousand four early adopter of you know of LinkedIn. I think it's a phenomenal business tool and. Again, as long as the information is accurate, i.e., identity verification, has to be yeah. confirmed. That I feel they've recently um, invested into. And I think this is great, or maybe it's just the people who use it. Is I always felt they have their living CV, right? It's an automatically updating CV. That's how they started out. But what what they haven't really focused on is that CVs are basically were worthless ten years ago, and even more so now. What you want to know is the specifics of, of someone's knowledge. They, you can say an atom, atomic level. And these little insights where you see, okay, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He didn't just put it in his CV. And as, not just the reputation, like you say, in terms of followers, but actually has deep knowledge in certain parts of that problem. Obviously, it doesn't have to make paper. And these things, you know, it could be YouTube videos, it could be um, small pieces of. of this is what I know about this, and if you ever have a question, reach out to me and I give you whatever, the first hour for free, and then you pay $400 or $600 an hour. And I think this is what always was missing from LinkedIn, and now they're really encouraging this knowledge sharing slightly better yeah. than at the atomic level. And I think that's that's finally happening. Maybe that's what explains the success. So I was, I was an investor in Clout, which tried to, uh, Joe Fernandez is the founder, um, yeah, no, no, yeah. Tr tried to, uh, create a score around some of those elements to give more of that granular how how well or how much do you know a particular subject mm -hmm. and a good friend of mine worked at keen k e e n dot com mm -hmm. which was which was a phone of dial in for expert advice or assistance or help on everything mm -hmm. from surfing okay. to and it it ended up going psychics and sex yeah Okay. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Consumer brain there. Yeah, there you yeah, go. The, the 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 limbic brain. Yeah. Is it, is it still around? Is it like a make it like a no no that was, dollars in black market money or? Yeah, this was also, you know, I, I Friendster era. 
Okay. Yeah, well, it happens. That happens. Um, going into crypto, what, what do you think was your general opinion on crypto? And, you know, we had the ICOs. Apparently, they didn't go anywhere because I've never heard of those companies again. They seem to all have vanished or maybe they do something in the background and we've never heard about it again. And then there's a lot of startups who put all their money in crypto because um, the Fed is going to ruin the dollar. And uh, there's a lot of crazy news about crypto. It's obviously crazy hype right now. What do you feel is going to be the Bitcoin of 2030? I, so there there are um, categories of information that I, I do not profess to know anything about. And I'm, and I'm going to say I've been studying crypto and blockchain for a while, and I'm going to still raise my hand as not being able to answer intelligently significant questions. Um, okay. And, and, and not, not be, not, I'm not a picker for crypto by any stretch. I know I have a lot of good friends who've been in it for a long time. Um, and we have invested out of, our, out of fund one and fund two more in what I'll, I'll, I'll describe. So in fund one, we have a company called Zabo and you think plaid for crypto. So everybody who's building any kind of app doesn't want to try to build their own wallet, build their own capability. Zabo enables that. For, for those entities and they spend all their time kind of like uh, a, a, a Tableau or a Domo working on the connectors and the APIs to make sure it works so that you can plug into Zabo for whatever, whatever and you allow your users to use whatever they want. Um, that's one. So it's more like picks and shovels for, for crypto than actual crypto. Um, yeah. So I can, so that we can start learning and get, get smarter and better at it. Plus it came in at, highly advised from a very good friend of mine who's got a who's got a, a, a crypto company second one um, we just invested in a fund too is called transmute and uh, Carol phenomenal entrepreneur she is building a solution for uh, the supply chain around the steel industry and all of the dynamics for import and export and one of the things we did as we courted and met and worked through our, you know, how we were going to operate and decided to invest was she had crypto up front or sorry, blockchain as part of the, uh, as part of the immutable ledger up front in the presentations, both on the selling side to entities and also in the fundraising side. And it became pretty clear to me that no one really cares which ledger or where you're located in the industry for being able to securely understand exactly where that cargo has come through, which port, who touched it, who didn't touch it. It doesn't matter. They just want the solution. So the blockchain is kind of immaterial. It just needs to be an immutable ledger that you know is functional and works and is correct. And then similarly, yeah. it wasn't a sell about crypto or blockchain or anything to do with it. Really, it wasn't. So that, 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 that those investors weren't there. It was more, it was more a sell around the supply chain and understanding exactly how she was going to transform how goods come into our borders and sit in customs and how all of that works and what that looks like way more than it was about blockchain or crypto. So when, when we shifted those ideas and actually just said, Hey, it's going to be part, it's, it's baked into the ecosystem. It completely changed the dynamic, significant more traction, both on selling side for both customers and for, um, for, for fundraising. Yeah. So, well, I, I, I listened to a couple of um, podcasts where, where, where VCs who, who there's a couple of funds now that only do um, you know decentralized finance, which is based on crypto. Yeah, and I felt like I only understood half of what they said. I, I didn't even know what it was, and they, they, they were certainly they were they were smart and they were they certainly know what's going on 100 percent more than me. But I felt like once you reach a way you got so far out of society where obviously your 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 technology is correct or maybe it is I can't judge. But if you can't explain to anyone what, what you're up to and what this thing actually does, you're entering a pretty high P place, right? That feels like 1999 where you come up with these crazy stories that that's still the high, but you're like, you couldn't, I couldn't explain it to, to my grandfather what I was up to. And I was like, right. okay, this is not a good sign. So let's better shift back a year. And that's how I feel. Or I'll take, I'll take 5% of my total holdings. I know it's coming. I know, I know there are a lot of great concepts around it. I know there are a lot of, things forcing us that direction in some fashion, no way can I pick the right one, right? So where's my mutual yeah. fund of, 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 of cryptocurrencies or what? And, and like somebody who spends all their time doing it, I'll give them a small percentage of my portfolio to invest in that sector because something's happening. I, yeah, and and unfortunately, 
that's hypothesis is sound that's how from, from my point of view of decentralized finance but there's a lot of intermediary steps and the way this 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 discussion has been elevated seems odd to me it sounds like icos to me but this might be just me yeah I, I'm, I'm still a novice i'm still learning yeah yeah well that's um that's very honest um that's <laughs> <laughs> it's you, know, you, gotta, you gotta go with the times um you, i you know i've I read your uh, parts of your book and i know as part of this you actually went to to entrepreneurs or to businessmen idols like the, like ross perot and interviewed them right and you you asked them what can we learn or what are these values we can extract from them um do you feel um that was something that really shaped you that you could absorb or was it something where you said, oh, I did this for a couple of years and it worked and I was really, um, you know, I was really excited about it. But in the end, the market has changed so much that some of these values I could never use again. So um, my, my book called Take Command, uh, 10 Leadership Principles I Learned in the Military and Put to Work for Donald Trump. That is the longest, like, I think in history, sec, you know, <laughs> take man's the name of the book, but that is part of the title. And the, and wanted the to make sure nobody remembers it. Right? The, pub, the publisher wanted that, that second part in there for keywords, I guess. Um, so, you know, I, Trump I, always sells. That, that's yeah. really what you thought. I, I won, um, re, I, I won a game show like FT, whatever FTC law. It was a, it's a game show, right? And I, and I, and I, I won a prize. My prize was paid out over 12 months. Right. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I wasn't a super accomplished entrepreneur at the time. I built a couple companies, knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, finished law and business school. And I'm like, okay, I want, I want to write a book that meshes everything that I think about this entire process, right? I can, I can write a book about leadership principles because that's key, key for me. And it doesn't matter what sector you're in. It doesn't matter what time of the, of the decade you're in. But I, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna write, if I'm going to write this book, and it also helps when you think about influencers. Right? I was on a show with 30 million watch the finale. I publish a book. I do a speaking engagements. And I'm thinking, okay, is this a business model? Can I, can I help you know, people who are looking for guidance and leadership, get guidance and planning? There's a lot of stuff that I learned in the military that I help them apply. Help entrepreneurs, help people coming out of the military who want to be entrepreneurs. And I was like, okay. Um, the media kept asking me, do you think your military background helped you with the show? Do you think your military background helped you with X? And I'm like, I finally got almost pissed off. Like okay. you don't under, like you don't understand anything about what happens in the military. If you're asking me spending four years at West Point and three and a half years of active duty, seven and a half years of my formative years of my life leading, you know, dozens and hundreds of people with tens and hundreds of millions of dollars before I was 25 years old. Do you think that helped me with anything? Like, I, you know, it was almost, my, my book was almost a, a talk to the hand. It's like, instead of talk to the hand, just read the book. Okay. And, and I said, but wait a second. I'm just Kelly Purdue from Los Angeles. I got, you know, I, I, went, I went to West Point, went to law and business school. Like, I haven't done anything that remarkable. I want to show. So I need to bring in credibility and validate that these these are the 10 leadership principles I think are super compelling that I learned in the military and I put to yeah. work in business. Let me go ask billionaires who've been successful in business, who also mm -hmm. have military veteran backgrounds to see if they are, if, that we're aligned that these are the principles and why they work. So that's what the story of the book is. Each chapter is one of the principles. I talk about an excerpt from the show. That's the weave in and also the reason I was even able to write a book. But I also what weave in, you know, Roger Staubach, uh, Pete Dawkins, right? You know, and it was funny because for people who don't know who Pete Dawkins is, he's a West Point graduate, Heisman Trophy winner, you know, general, super, super, super well known, commanded forces, was, I think at the time that I met him, was the chairman at Citibank. So I got him to have a meeting with me, right? I got a 30 minute block, block of time with him, and I walked in and I've got my old school recording, recording device, and I'm asking him, I'm like, so I'm doing, I'm writing a book on leadership. He goes, stop right there. Yeah. I spent the last 30 years of my life researching leadership. And he points at his bookshelf, and it's every, every leadership book ever written, three of or four of them by him, right? And he's like, let me boil it down for you. Leadership 
is the ability to motivate others to action. Period. That's it. You can do it yeah. with sticks. You can do it with carrots. You can talk about all the different mechanisms, but that's what leadership is. And, and it was things like that that are in my book, you know, in my book that I, you know, I couldn't, there's, I couldn't have paid for that. So it was an incredible experience for me. And it was also a validation of what I had learned from being in the military. And it's not like integrity is not taught in the military. It is taught in the military, but it's like, you get that from your family. Like you were saying earlier, right? A lot of the social institutions like impeccability. Yeah. You want to make a good first impression passion. If you don't exhibit a passion in what you're doing as an entrepreneur, as a business person, like you're, Nobody wants to be a, nobody wants to be around a downer. Like if you're down and negative and nasty all the time about stuff, you're just not gonna, you're gonna spend your life alone eventually, right? So yeah. these are not like aha. These are the nobody knew that these were leadership principles. They're they're things that we focus on, things that are very very important when you're in the military and are actually trained. Super impactful when you're in business and the leadership principles we look for when we're investing in entrepreneurs. I think you, you just you just mentioned it, but. You know what? What I wanted to 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 inquire is, if you go deep down and if you say, um, you know, this this is the, I wrote a book and there's there's leadership principles, and but since since nobody can listen to this because it's not broadcasted at all, I'm just curious. <laughs> so those are things from, from where you feel like, well, they a they really helped me a lot, and b they 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 hold true basically forever. They've been true for thousands of years. Um, we might only know about them now, or we may maybe rediscovering them. But this is this is something that that helped me much more than I expected. And I think you just said that I was I was just curious because a lot of people talk about values and talk about business, but they don't really believe it. I feel right. It's, it's a bit of an act. It's a bit of a motivational coach thing. Yeah. No, I, I I'm training my children with these. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I I mean, They're you know, already se selfless. Necessary. You know, it's duty, right? Which is do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. Half of the problems in the existence would go away if that just one thing was front and center. Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it, right? Impeccability. Yeah, my, my children are not very open to that idea. Impeccability. Don't turn in crap. Yeah. Like cross your T and dot your I. Yes, there's a diminishing return on what you can get done, especially in an entrepreneurial environment. But if you're delivering a deck to a vet entrepreneur that, you know, a venture capitalist, and you don't spell their name right. You haven't re done any like under understand what you know. You're, you're, you, you that's that's how much attention you're going to pay to your product. Why am I giving? Why am I going to? I have been given the honor of investing money on behalf of LPs, and this is part of what investing in military entrepreneurs is. We have entrusted military entrepreneurs with our sons and daughters in harm's way. Yeah, they that's sacred. They think you think about that when you're an officer in the military and you're 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 in charge of these people, their lives, right? It's not too dissimilar when you give them money. When you when I invest my money with you, you have a they feel a fiduciary responsibility. It's not like oh, it's other people's money. I'm just spending it and don't care about it. So there's a there's a very um, serious element to that. I'm not saying non-military people don't necessarily feel that way. I'm just there. You they, that's how they feel because they've been in that environment. Yeah, it's a bit like it's a bit like you know the 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 Israelites, right? You're part of a chosen group, and you you kind of you you got to make up your mind: do you want to stay part of that chosen group or not? And you know that's my related question. That I always ask that: Do you think religious values, and especially Old Testament, much more than New Testament values, they they or, or outside of those two religions like Buddhism or, or Hinduism, just do you feel that the Old Testament values? make a big impact and aren't they describing something very similar to entrepreneurship? So I have not tried to run an exact parallel of the 10 commandments against my 10 leadership principles, but <laughs> integrity is on there. They're different. I can tell you. Yeah. They, yeah. I, I can tell you that. Lo lo loyalty. Loyalty is on there. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, yeah, you know, there's a lot, you know, if, you, if you're being pushed, well, whatever we just talked about, and I, I totally yeah. agree with that. If you yeah. push this to a couple of abstraction layers higher, you, you're not just ending up with Exodus um, 
and the Ten Commandments, you are ending up, you know, with the spirit of, you know, the Bible is a long document, but yeah. it changes and people do weird stuff. They're not angels, right? They're, they're like crazy people and uh, yeah. just prostitutes and lots of weird stuff going on. For sure. But yeah. you, you, you realize that there is this struggle for, for, I don't want to say the word moral superiority, but, but being the best person you can. And then I thought you were going to say perfection. Person. I thought you were going to say the struggle for perfection. Yeah. Attempting yeah, the that's Maslow, really or Maslow's yeah. hierarchy, self-actualizing, right? Acting, yes. fulfill acting your with, potential. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, fulfill, fulfill your potential and acting with. And, and I think about it with my kids. Like people, oh, I hope they grow up and be happy. I'm like, I don't know that I want them to be happy. I want them to have. A, I want them to be purposeful. Yeah, right. I, I, I want them to have a purposeful life so that they can contribute and feel like they're contributing. Maybe that's this, what, you kind of like you can't happens. tell this to any of the parents in Silicon Valley. Though. They they think it's all happiness. That's all what what comes, yeah. which and is really strange and ruins the children's lives. Uh, yes, <laughs> my point of view, but it's just me, right? I'm definitely not yeah. the majority. And I go uh, to my children's school. That's not going to fly there, which is strange, right? It should be like an in 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 value in our society, but somehow this has gotten lost because nobody has talked about it. I feel like we we in this renaissance. You know, people haven't hadn't talked about the Greeks for like a thousand years, and then they find these books and they say, "Oh man, well, we actually we're, we're still dealing with the same problem. So why don't we see what the old the old books say?" And you're like, "Um, the moral issues are actually the same. Technology is same exact. Yeah, I don't I, I don't believe that there's a shelf life on the ten leadership principles that I defined in the that I learned in the military and and their applicability to business and or and or life. Right? They're just planning." Perseverance, yeah. don't give up. Planning. If you don't if you're not tracking on a plan, like I do this, I, I say, okay, who's got a business plan? It's like, yeah, how many pages? How many like and everybody's got a business plan, everybody's thought through it, they got a board of directors, they got advisors. And I'm like, how many of you have your life plan written down? Next five just five years out. And it's blank mm -hmm. stairs. And it's like, uh uh well, this idea that you have for you're actually living your life right now, what you know, where do you want to live in five years? Who do you, you know, how, how, what's your family structure look like? How's your, you know, where are you in your religious progression or not? Like what, whatever's important to you, like have you mapped them out? Because if you're not, if you're not tracking and measuring it, you, you're just floating around. And I, I do believe that there's a lot of just floating around going yeah, on. For uh, a lot well, of yeah, that's, that's 99%. <laughs> well, what, 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 I want to, I want to, what I, I want to return that volley to you and say, what's, what, what's next for, for Kelly? Well, what are you going to do in the next five years? Well, what, besides what, what's, besides what's go to mean? a Western European country that will take Grant Purdue. He's Grant at Grant Purdue 10 on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. for, uh, You're going to live for, in Barcelona and go, go to soccer practice with this on Yeah, yeah that's, that's for sure. But besides it. that, so I, I just going to become Kelly man. This this pandemic has given me you know some significant time to think about things and um, I, I can't truly ask to be in a very different spot from being able to deploy resources to assist passionate fired up entrepreneurs that want to do change stuff in the world. It's like the best. Well, I I hope it's it's a maybe get rich slow scheme. Because it's not a get rich fast. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. These, these investments are like, but it is, and it's not. I feel like I'm enriched along the way because literally every day, you meet someone who's fired up and passionate about changing the world on some dynamic, and you you help get the sectors and content by how you market yourself and what you focus on and how you do. So you see a lot. You see a like some of the smartest people in the world, who are the most accomplished people in the world that want to without a whole lot of real care about, you know, my annual salary or how long it's going to take. It's like five or 10 years. It's like, it's a, that's a long-term component from, from an entrepreneurial standpoint. And you know, you can help them. I know, I know I'm able to help them. So yeah, that's a pretty phenomenal position to be in. Yeah. And, you know, I've had, a, I've had a, you know, over the years, a significant inbound, like, hey, are you going to run for office? You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And yeah. wh wherever I, I think that I'm able to move the needle the most, whether it's from a, you know, having these leadership principles be ab abstracted a couple times and be, you know, objectives or things that we would want to aspire for, I, I'm, 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 keeping, I'm keeping options open. 
which I guess is is that is that form of the aversion to risk that we talked about earlier. For, for yeah, you know, yeah, for you, know you do you, like like we talked about. But I, I think you know that, that what you just mentioned that the running for office obviously it feeds our feeds our ego. But on sure. the other hand, um, we bit. have this this horrible class of politicians that that we elected. I mean, I didn't elect them, but the people around me did. And one part of that is that. That, that's why I'm in San Francisco now, like like Jesus said, you, you don't have to care about the healthy, you want to care about the sick, so I need to be where the sick people are. And yeah. in that sense, so much has gone wrong with public policy, maybe because we were too comfortable, or because communists were some sort of effective. I don't actually know the reasons, and I don't think people are ready to make a big shift yet, but the time is coming, and I think this is, well, I don't want to say a religious awakening, but there's definitely a change in focus on public policy in order to you know, salvage of what's gone wrong. And it's gone wrong because the times were good enough and we didn't have a big enemy and everything was, was fine, right? I mean, this is not the end of the world. I'm just saying people like you who, who have the track record and have the public recognition in a public office, you know, you can change the life of, of, of millions, um, 40 million Californians in a heartbeat. Yeah, it, it is. It's that duty, right? Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. Like the high, yeah. the, the higher calling, the 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 servant leader mentality and DNA that Craig and I have and look for in the entrepreneurs too, and in, in how we invest and what we invest in, and trying to think about what's the impact. I mean, our kind of long term vision for Moonshots Capital has always been not oh fun two, fun four, fun. Five. It's more like a company where yeah. we have been able to fund the next pick one, the next unicorn CEO. Because they're thirty percent more likely to hire military veterans, and these people went out and put their life on the line, and some of them are in good condition, bad condition, but they've done significant amounts. They perform really well. They've had leadership training, and so thematically, for where we could move the needle in what we were doing, this felt in a form like giving back. Craig's a Craig's a my partner's a Henry Crown fellow, and Moonshots Capital is literally his. Fellowship. That's the thing that he's focused on as part of that group um, to execute to execute against it. So it's a it's a mission kind of unto itself to enable you know some pr some pretty amazing companies to change the world with some military veteran entrepreneurs incorporated into them who are hopefully hiring military veteran entrepreneurs and like like it 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 it's a cycle. Um, you know wh where that five to ten year time time period is. I I, I you know funds are ten year vehicles. We just raised fund two, so I'm, I'm and the investment period is three to six years usually. So I'm I'm good for the next three to six years with this execution, um, but I don't know what the next iteration is. Well, I'm I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to it, and I I hope you consider coming back and uh, telling telling us what what your immediate updates is and how these plans have evolved over time. That'd be fantastic, Torsten. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. That was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you, Kelly.